<laughs> Thank you, Beth, very much. That was beautiful. Welcome to worship, everyone. Um, my heart is filled with joy at this time, sorry. <laughs> um, just to know that you are there, uh, even though it's virtually. Um, this has been a hard time for everybody. And uh, the spirit is definitely moving this morning. Why we, why I doubt that, um, though we can't see each other sometimes is, is, is maybe not good. But knowing that I can see some of you right now through um, this virtual lens gives us um, a connectability, that's a word, um, through our worship, through the Holy Spirit that is joyful at this moment. Just a, a few um, housekeeping uh, measures as we continue. I uh, wanted to let you know that it does help us out if you keep muted, unless you are part of the service um, in the recording, and um, that way we won't hear um, when the um, uh, our lo other loved ones and or um, pets cough or bark or do anything like that. It won't distract us from our worship, but also um, wanted to add the note um, if by chance you are online and the audio gets to be a little bit um, skippy or it pans out every once in a while, try um, turning off your video because that will give us more bandwidth to which um, we can um, allow people to hear on a better level. Um, believe me, this is all new and weird to all of us and we're um, in this together. So. We are going to try to do our best to go through our worship this morning, and um, we'll see what happens. So with all that, let us prepare our hearts as um, Pastor Mike comes up to begin our worship. Good morning, brothers and sisters in the faith. Let us take a brief moment to prepare our hearts and our minds to worship together. Let us join together now in the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Amen. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, we who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Join with me at home. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have un resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O oh God. Give us new hearts and right spirits that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, says our God. All your sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. And from home, let us join together in our gathering hymn found in our red hymnals, hymn number 339.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones is a promise that Israel as a nation, though dead in exile, will live again in their land through God's life-giving spirit. Three times Israel is assured that through this vision, they will know that I am the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. They were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and the flesh had come upon them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, 
Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This morning's psalm is Psalm 130. Please feel free to join me on the bold verses from your home. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness in order that you may be feared. I wait for you, O Lord, my soul waits. In your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who keep watch for the morning, more than those who keep watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. For the Lord shall redeem Israel from all their sins. I've second, got it going. The second lesson is a reading from Romans. To set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks be to, to God. God. Just a quick reminder that um, it's best if we can mute ourselves while um, we're during, uh, during worship. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after, he said, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because 
the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that that he will uh, rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Then she had, when she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is coming for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at that place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. They began, Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? When Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb, it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace from our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ to you this day. Amen. So my sermon comes from our first lesson this morning, the, the reading of Ezekiel. And as a child, I remember my grandmother always saying during winter months, I am chilled to the bone as we would get into her car for an outing. 
And of course, me being the quick thinking grandson, I'd always say, but grandma, you have a coat and clothes and skin. How does the coldness of the air get to your bones? And she would respond, oh, Randall, most handsome and smart of all my grandchildren. Okay, she really didn't say that. But she said, the chilliness of this wintry day cuts through all of that so deep, I feel it in my bones. We feel it in our bones. Most of us use this expression when there is something that maybe we can't explain, but yet we simply know. We find there's something in this event that we're undergoing. It's so eternal that a voice within ourselves expresses whatever it is that we're feeling as deep within our bones. We feel this, we know this deep in our core. This is an expression we can literally find in the book of Genesis as Adam first looks at Eve and understands and says, at last, this is bone of my bones. Ralph Jacobson, a theologian from Luther Seminary, says this. Towards the end of the oracle in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, we hear the words of lament of the deported people. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. One finds similar language in the lament psalms. My strength fails because of my misery, and my bones waste away, Psalm 31. My bones are shaking with terror, Psalm 6. My bones burn like a furnace, Psalm 102. The reference to bones here is an idiomatic way of referring to one's deepest self, or in the case of our bones, a way for the community to refer to its most essential self. The Israelites experience this deep-seated feeling because their normal is no longer. Ralph Jacobson continues, the exile was more than just a crisis of physical suffering and communal identity. It also necessitated a crisis of faith. The key symbols of Judean faith, Jerusalem, its temple, its people, and the Davidic monarchy had been destroyed. According to the theological rationality of the ancient world, many exiled Judeans assumed that their deity had been defeated by a stronger deity from Babylon. The people wondered if the Lord was truly Lord and truly faithful. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel some of these days. I feel it in my bones. They are dry. I feel cut off completely. The heaviness of this feeling, of this new coronavirus, this feeling we have is one of grief. Like the Israelites, we are grieving. We are grieving our normalcy. We are grieving what we are used to. Our normal has been changed by outside forces, and we feel the weight of it. And that weight is grief. I mean, here's the situation. All of us are affected. We have loved ones dying because of this disease, and we can't comfort them. We can't even hold funerals. We have children grieving events and absences of family and friends of their lives with no way of helping them. We have little ones who can't understand to to begin to understand this situation, but know that their regular lives are interrupted. Parents are trying their best to walk alongside these children and their families, yet we're grieving ourselves. We are grieving the loss of regular contact and wondering when it will be over. This week, I stumbled across an article from the Harvard Business Review that was called 
that discomfort you're feeling is grief, written by Scott Bernardo. He interviews David Kelser, who is a co-author with Elizabeth um, Kubler on the book On Grief and Grieving, Finding the Meaning of Grief Through the Five Stages of Loss. It was an interview and is set up as such with the question Scott had, people are feeling any number of things right now. Is it right to call some of what we're feeling grief? And Kessler says, yes, we are feeling a number of different griefs. We feel the world has changed and it has. We know this is temporary, but it doesn't feel that way. And we realize things will be different. Just as going to the airport is forever different from now, from how it was before 9-11. Things will change, and this is the point at which they changed. The loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection. This is hitting us, and we're grieving collectively. We are not used to this kind of collective grief in the air. Scott asked, Do you, you said we were feeling more than one, kinds of gr one kind of grief. And he answers, yes, we are also feeling anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief is that feeling when we get out, when we, when we get about, anticipatory grief is that feeling we get about what the future holds when we are uncertain. Usually it centers on death. We feel it when someone gets a dire diagnosis or when we have the normal thought that we'll lose a parent someday. Anticipatory grief is also more broadly imagined futures. There's a storm coming. There's something bad out there. With a the virus, this kind of grief is so confusing for people. Our primitive mind knows something bad is happening, but we can't see it. This breaks our sense of safety. We're feeling that loss of safety. I don't think we've collectively lost our sense of general safety like this. Individually or as small groups, people have felt this. But altogether, this is new. We are grieving on a micro and a macro level. So what can we do to manage all this grief? And he says, understand the stages of grief is a start. But whenever you talk about the stages of grief, I have to remind people that the stages aren't linear and may not happen in this order. It's not a map, but it provides some scaffolding for this unknown world. There's denial, which we may say a lot of, which we may say a lot of early on. It's this virus won't affect us. There's anger. We're making, you're making me stay home and take away all my activities. And then there's bargaining. Okay, if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be better, right? Then there's sadness. I don't know when this will end. And finally, there's acceptance. This is happening. I have, I have to figure out how to proceed. Acceptance, as you might imagine, is where the power lies. And we find control in acceptance. I can wash my hands. I can keep a safe dip distance. I can learn how to work virtually. Like in our scripture, know that God through the Holy Spirit is with you, is with us. The beginning of Ezekiel, it says, he said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I, lay, I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Do you notice the subtle difference between this opening paragraph and what proceeds? In this opening paragraph, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy, and the first thing God claims is he will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. 
But in the order of things, as it actually happens in the rest of the pericope, he says that the sinews, or he actually lays the sinews and the flesh upon the bones, and they stand. Yet there's no life. It's as if God knew we needed to hear we would be fully alive with the breath of God, but first there has to be the embodiment for that breath to enter into. The point of this happening draws our attention to the breath of God and the Holy Spirit and what it and what brings us life. It reminds me when I was in high school, and one of my favorite movies was The Karate Kid. The Holy Spirit works like Mr. Miyagi. The Holy Spirit is teaching us skills like Mr. Miyagi was teaching Daniel, Daniel's son, if you will, in The Karate Kid. If you're familiar with the movie, it's a movie about a boy who moves out from New Jersey to California with his mom. He gets beat up by uh, some bullies, and he, then he's looking for a way to learn how to protect himself. And he finds Mr. Miyagi, who is a karate instructor. Mr. Miyagi agrees to teaching him and invites him to his house. But the only thing he gives Daniel to do are chores around the house, like painting a fence up and down, up and down, and waxing cars. Wax on, wax off. The chores end up teaching Daniel defensive moves for his karate training. The Holy Spirit is training us in a way we don't even realize. We have this new time on our hands. How are we using it? I wonder what the Holy Spirit is teaching us through the context we find ourselves in, individually and corporately. I asked my friends what they were learning in this new way of living. And they said that they were noticing all the small things. They were actually slowing down to see what is their most high priority. Noticing bones around them and realizing there is still life in them. They're praying for those who they would not normally pray for. They're looking for new ways of communication through technology. They're checking on neighbors who they haven't seen in years. They're finding commonality with others who they usually wouldn't. One reminded me, after just taking a walk, it meant so much more to smile or wave to somebody knowing that they are both going through the same situation the same travesty, the same caution, together. The whole world is going through the same thing you are going through, that we are going through. As we mourn not being able to meet at our church home, we also realize that we are still the church. You are the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the church. Now, God did not cause the COVID-19 virus to happen. Yet God is with us, working through the Holy Spirit, the Ruah in us, the same spirit, the breath, the wind. God blew into Adam and Eve. The same breath that was blown into the bones by Ezekiel's prophecy. The same breath God used to breathe into the disciples after his resurrection in the upper room in John 20. The Spirit brings us life. It restores our hope. Ezekiel's parable is one of the many creation stories we hear that reminds the Israelites and us that God is present and God is a God of new beginnings in the midst of nothing, in the midst of dry bones. God does his best work with nothing. In Romans, we hear 
To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. In the psalm we hear, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who keep watch in the morning, O Israel. Wait for the Lord, for the Lord there is steadfast in love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. And in the Gospel of John, we hear another creation story when things are so dire. Jesus himself is so deeply moved. He weeps. Yet the Spirit moves and brings Lazarus out of the grave and then calls to those around him to unbind him and let him go so that they may all rejoice in new life and live to the full. My dear friends, God is with you. God breathes new life into you now through hearing the gospel proclaimed in order that you may learn new skills, new life lessons, new ways of connecting and forgiving and loving and living. Amen. We please join us in song and sing with us what wondrous life is this as found in your bulletin or your hymnal. Please join together with me in the profession of our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of life, bind your faithful people into one body, enliven the church with your spirit, and bless the work of those who work for its renewal. Accomplish your work of salvation in us and through us for the sake of the world. Hear us, O God. Your no, mercy no, is no. great. God of life, you love the world you have made and you grieve when creation suffers. Restore polluted lands and waterways. Heal areas of the world ravaged by storms, floods, wildfires, droughts, or other natural disasters. Bring all things to new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, show redemption to all who watch and wait with eager expectation. Those longing for wars to cease, those waiting for immigration paperwork to finalize, those seeking election, those in dire need of humanitarian relief, those families who are dealing with the death of, death of a loved one due to COVID-19, those who have the virus, those dealing with separation from loved ones because of the virus, show your redemption to those dealing with being laid off from their jobs and the uncertainty that brings and students traveling back home to those separated from family and friend, or friends and activities. Come quickly with your hope. Hear us, O oh God. Your yes. mercy is great. God of life, you weep with those who grieve. Unbind all who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain. Especially Herb Ohm, Candy English, Joe Harrington, Jason Gianni, Phil and Shirley Cardella, Rosalie and Paul Hudeman, Chuck Deutsch, Mary Walter, Jeff Williams, John Engler, Beth Burnett, Denise Myers, Pastor Judy Fallis, Barb Krutz, Christy Hammer Wright, Tom Gilbert, Charlotte Erdman, Donna Lewis, Jesse Skaggs, Carol Welker, John Watt, Katie Gasco, Cindy, Cindy Modlin Adams, and friends, Megan and Andrew, Ben Binky, the family and friends of Nicole, Barbara and Merrick, Kim Beery, Joe, Lynn, Connor, and Mason Brocius, Rob, Kashan, and the family and friends of Carol Squillis and Patty Mallet. Fill us with compassion and empathy for those who struggle and keep us faithful in prayer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, we give thanks for opportunities for this congregation to collaborate with our community in caring for the needs of our neighbors. Thank you for Lafayette Urban Ministry. Family Promise, Jubilee Christmas, Packaway Hunger, and Mission Guatemala. Strengthen our ties with other local congregations, agencies, and services. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you are our resurrection. We remember all those who have died and trust that in you they will live again. Breathe new life into our dry bones that we too might live with you forever. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy, your mercy is great. great. 
According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to share peace in the screen to all of us. Pastor Randy, come on in. Let us share peace with one another. Christ's peace be with all of you in this time. And this is also a great reminder that there are multiple ways of continuing to give to the life and ministry of our Savior Lutheran Church and Purdue Lutheran Ministry. You can see printed in your bulletin ways to continue to do that. And so please continue to support the ministries that we are still actively doing in this time. Lord Christ, teach us how to pray. Join with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us now join together in our sending hymn, also found in your red hymnal, hymn number 758. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. <laughs> 